Right, it's uh, just past 12.30 by my watch. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are still waiting for our guests to join in. There she is. Uh, let me just admit it. Okay, I think uh, our guest has just joined. Um, hi. Yes, hi, Wandi. Thank, thanks so much for for coming through. Um, no problem. Right, I think we can uh, start already. Uh, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my task really today is to uh, invite our host today and 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 the guest, and to also um, sort of warn you that this session is being recorded. So our assumption is that you give us uh, uh, your consent to record and to share this uh, on our various platforms. If this is not uh, something you would want us to do, please just um, type no in the chat box. Other than that, we would assume that uh, we do have uh, your consent to record and circulate, share this recording uh, on our social media platforms. Right, so uh, like I said, my task is very simple. Um, uh, let me just uh, invite our host today, Tina Magatla. Tina. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Um, so I'm Tina Magatla, and I'm going to be your host today. Um, it is my pleasure today to introduce our guest, novelist Yewanda Omotoso. Um, so Yewanda Omotoso is an architect who holds an MA in creative writing from the University of Cape Town. Her debut novel, Bomb Boy, won the South African Literary Award First Time Author Prize. Her short stories include how about the children, things are hard, fish, and the leftovers. Yewande was a 2015 Miles Morland Scholar. Her second novel, The Woman Next Door, was shortlisted for the International Dublin Literary Award and longlisted for the Bailey's um, Women's Literature Prize. Her third novel, An Unusual Grief, was published in 2021. So, Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome, everyone. And Yawanda, thank you so much for being with us here today. It is a pleasure, it is a, an absolute pleasure to have you here. And it is quite an impressive bio that you have. Hi, Tina, and thanks, everyone. Thanks, Oliver. Are we, is it, are we deliberately invisible just because of bandwidth and ESCOM? Or should I turn on my video at least so you see that? I exist I'm a real person. You can turn on your video if you want. Um, I'm not turning mine on because I'm working on a desktop, so I don't have a camera. But yes, thank you for showing us your face. <laughs> um, so before we begin, I would like to, I have a disclaimer and it is, if I mispronounce anything, um, please accept my apologies in advance and please feel free to create me. So, as a starting point, I would like you to give us a brief talk or a brief idea on your personal and literary biography. I'm interested in your philosophy of writing and what writing means to you. Okay, okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, I, Oliver had also asked that I do a reading. So will you let me know at what point um, in the uh, then you'd like me to do that? Or is this a good time to do it before getting into the discussion? Or skip it all together? Just want to make sure I don't miss it out. Pardon, I didn't hear that. Oliver has asked, had asked that I prepare a reading. Is this a, um, would you let me know when you'd like me to, to do the reading? I think we can begin with that. I think that's a great starting point, actually. 
Okay, good. So I'll do the reading and then answer your question. And your question was to, to begin with the basic um, story about my journey to writing. Yes. Okay. All right. So I'll read from my latest novel, which is An Unusual Grief, that was published um, in South Africa earlier this year. Um, it's my third novel. And it's a novel about a mother whose daughter takes her life. And at the time of the incident, mother and daughter haven't seen each other for almost a year and are profoundly estranged. So it's also a novel in some ways about a, a mother who has to grieve the death of her child, but also has unfinished business with the child. Um, so I'll just read a short piece from that. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, great. Mojisola's eyes are small and precise. Her cheeks, not high boned, but pronounced, are soft. Her skin is okay, not great, because of an outbreak of acne in her 16th year that left her even more shy and uncertain of her beauty. Still, Mojisola has shiny hair, an enviable bust, a melodic voice, and a melancholic look that when courting was finally appropriate, attracted poets and accountants alike. Titus, her husband, is neither. In her adult years, her university years, away from the judgment of her mother, Mujisola was complimented, mostly by her female classmates, on the loveliness of her calves, their length and generous shape, the bones in her ankles. In fact, the entire stretch of leg, the pair of them, was admired. It is with these legs, they have not changed, that she walks slowly into her daughter's apartment, shuts the door behind her, takes two steps, hangs her head, closes her eyes. She must stand here. Eventually she must move too, because she knows she won't die, not yet. She'll live long, that's her charge. She opens her eyes and looks about. Someone has left her a note, but in a language she does not speak. It is not sufficient to translate. The note must be read in its original language. If she had lived a different life, she, Mujisala, would be fluent by now and in no need of translation. But she has lived the life she has and it has brought her here now. The task ahead is daunting but clear. She must learn the language in which the note is written and ultimately read the message. This is what it is like for Mojisala to be standing in number 81, standing in the home of her dead child, a space she has never been in, was never invited to. I'll stop there, just a short little thing. Um, so you asked uh, Tina about talking a bit about how I came to writing. I hope I'm interpreting your question accurately. Um, so yes, I mean, I studied architecture and I, I like to say when I finished um, high school, I wanted to study English um, as some of you might be doing and, um, and become a writer. I knew I would want to write in English. And so I thought I should, I should get studies in the English language. My dad, who happened to be an English scholar himself, dissuaded me quite forcefully and said no, that it would lead to a life of precarity. And he wanted me to do something a lot more solid. You know, I'm a woman, that kind of lecture. So um, I ended up studying architecture. And that's how come it's a bit of a funny journey. But obviously, yeah, if, you, if you're a storyteller, then you're a storyteller. And, and I think uh, once I graduated as an architect and had worked for a year or so, I realized I still wanted to study and I wanted to learn how to put a book together. So I, I applied to, to do the MA in creative writing. And um, that was how I, uh, Bomboy was my master's um, thesis that was later published. So that's, I guess, the, the, the base, the, the kind of the steps in, in practical terms. But yeah, I think I think the seed for storytelling was sown from a very young age. I was lucky to grow up in a family. Uh, I grew up on a university campus in Nigeria. The camp uh, in Ileife University is called o OAU or Bathemi Awolowo University. 
and um, I, I, my, my dad was a lecturer in the, a lecturer in the dramatic arts department at the time, and it afforded my brothers and I access to playwrights and poets and writers and just a world that was normalized actually so that making stories and writing and being a poet or whatever felt like hygiene i mean i always like to say read, reading should be like brushing your teeth it's just one of those things that one can do um and writing and making stuff up became became that as well um and so from a very young age that was something that i did and wanted to do and you know wanted to do well Thank you so much for that response. I did see the um, architecture background in your second, especially in your second book. Um, so um, I guess what I want to know is, are you a full-time writer or part-time? And I think you've touched a bit on this, but do you consider yourself a full-time writer or a part-time writer? And would you say that writing in South Africa or in Africa in general is enough evocation to financially sustain the writer? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a it's a good question, and I think it also has to do with the the words we use. For a long time, um, for a long time, let's say after so after Bomboy came out, um, I wanted to write my second novel, and I just wanted I wrote Bomboy very much in between, working as an architect and doing many other things besides. Um, but when I wanted to write my second book, I thought, okay let me be daring and do what they say you shouldn't do. So I quit my day job and I moved in with my father who lived in Joburg, which is what found me in Joburg. Actually, I left Cape Town so that I, and I asked for a year, you know, I said to him, I'll come, I won't stay longer than, than that. And if things haven't worked out after that year, I'll, I'll go back to a much more formalized uh, uh, form of employment. Um, so in that year, while I was writing, I was lucky, like I, I could apply and was lucky to get fellowships or scholarships or residencies, um, things that could help me piece a life together. You know, I, um, I, still had, I still needed money. I needed to buy my own food and, you know, things like that. So, but I pared down my responsibilities so that I could focus on, on the writing. Um, so I say all of that to say that I think we use a certain language when we talk about writers. We don't use the same language when we talk about, you know, somebody starting a business. So if somebody's starting a business that's like, I moved at home and I put it in the garage, ooh, young entrepreneur, ooh. But if a writer's doing it, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, crazy artist. So I, I, it's a business, right? It's a business. I thought, okay, I need a bit of time. When you open that business, it doesn't start, you know, giving you profit. Um, and it takes it takes effort and input and it takes um, thought and rationale and de deliberate gest um, deliberate decisions at different points of the growth of that business. Um, so I mean I think a big issue with this idea of writing and money is that we don't we don't use the lexicon of business in the world of art. This terrible separation that has been made and sometimes maintained, I think, is detrimental. Um, so I, at times, approached it that way. And um, that was, when did I leave Cape Town? I don't know, that was like 2012 or 13. Um, sure enough, I, and so certainly luck is, is there. I was lucky, I got, I got a good publishing deal. I could leave, I could find my own home, and I just continued. Um, and so for, I would say for, about, for almost, not quite, but maybe almost a decade, I was, living off my craft, I would say. Does it mean that the proceeds of the books were what was always paying for the roof over my head? No, but sometimes because the book existed and maybe got a certain amount of attention, somebody would ask me to give a lecture and pay me really well, or they'll fly me somewhere and pay me really well, or I would get a scholarship that was very generous and would allow me to live for a year. Um, and I think in business, it's the same way, like in the business, I have these things on this shelf and these things on this shelf. I might not make the money from the ones on the shelf on the right, but the money I make from the stuff on the left helps me subsidize these other things. And that way of thinking really helped me allow my craft to sustain me. Um, 
and it allowed me to not feel like I was failing or that I was cheating the art or that it's somehow unartistic to, you know, have these engagements with money. Um, recently, really, uh, I'm, a, well, I'm a not young mother of young ch children and, and my kids are two now, um, twin boys. And a lot of, I do now, I am now in a much more formalized kind of employment. Um, four days a week and most and most of why I'm doing that is because of the children but up till that point I was really freelancing um and and writing and writing the books I think that is quite an interesting way to view writing and I think if a lot of us viewed it that way it would be a, a lot braver not just to, not not just to pursue writing but also to pursue all kinds of um crafts um mm -hmm. So I think what I've heard from what you said so far, I think that writing is something that has always been at the back of your mind, always followed you. And um, so I'm interested to know that, that um, how would you describe your purpose as, as an author? You know, for some people, um, for, table, for a table, for instance, um, he's known to claim that, that he wrote to teach. So how would you define your purpose as an author? Mm, yeah. I mean, the purpose is, is, at least the first purpose is much more selfish than Achebe is in, in the sense that I, I feel like I write to be sane. I write to be a, like just a decent human being. I was actually saying to my partner the other day, when I'm like, I noticed that I, I get into a dark space and I'm not particularly useful to the people around me. And then I remember I haven't written in a while or I haven't read in a while. So I, and I, I know that, I know I'm a better person when I'm a reading person and a writing person, I'm a better person. So, so from that angle, I think that's, that's, that's one of the reasons I write. I think also it's, it's hard to go back and really locate that point. You know, that's why I just sort of credit my childhood because I feel like I came, I came, I came out of the womb hearing stories, you know, um, and so that sort of situation would mean that I've, I've always been introduced to the possibility of inventiveness, you know, using language. Um, so I also, I also think of writing as sort of the best, also the best thing I can offer um, or the, uh, the, the, the thing I can best try to offer. Um, it's not always perfect. Um, it's often mangled, it's hard to do well, uh, but it's an endeavor that feels to me that one of the most worthwhile endeavors to spend my life um, making, using language to make, to make stuff. Mm. I resonate with your, with your first reason so much. Um, I, I gather that you have, you grew up around, um, around writing, and that kind of thing. But I'm interested to know that, do you think writing is something that can be learned or do you think that it's a pure talent that you either have or you do not have? Yeah, I, yeah, no, no, I, I, I don't, the, the former, you know, I think, I think writing can be learned. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, and it's maybe I don't I don't I don't say it to be cute or to sort of be Disney, but I do think we're creative beings. Um, I think we lose those things, which means writing is something that can be relearned, and creativity is something that can be relearned, remembered. Um, you, you find your way back to, uh, and I think I look at my kids; they're just sort of naturally inventive and. Um, you know they're playing and they just know because because writing and creativity that's about play and we forget to play you know we all know that as kids playing is important and then somewhere as adults we forget that playing is still important um and i think i'm still learning to write um I, i'm recently part of a program an adaptation course really exciting course adapting text to film uh, and, and my project is to adapt um a novel to film um, and it's fascinating to be learning this you know and I always love um, 
Nur Din Farah always says like when he when he starts writing a book, when he starts writing another book, and he's written so many, when he starts writing another book, he um he he realizes that he doesn't know how to write books. And I, I loved that because I thought, yeah, the the, the 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 writer who knows how to write books is the one that's in trouble. You 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 must never know because the knowing is what uh sinks. Um, sinks the possibility of discovery and creativity. It's the not knowing, it's the sense of wonder, it's the, um, the curiosity, the puzzle, the mystery. That's for me what, what's the engine. Um, and so you, you can always be learning and you must actually. Um, so how do you go about choosing a genre or a form of writing? How do you decide whether to write a novel or a short story or, or perhaps a poem? And why have you favored the, the, the novel form so far? Because it does seem like you are quite involved with various creative pursuits. So how have you chosen your genres? Yeah, it's such a great question because, I, I mean, firstly, the, the, the question is like, okay, does one choose the genre or is it more that you reckon you, you sort of, you explore the idea sufficiently that you understand where this might belong. And it's always a hunch and you could be wrong, you know. Um, so, so for instance, an idea comes um, and you start writing a novel, but actually it's a short story. And, and maybe you realize that because, um, because something isn't working. Um, I've never, Initially, had to choose. I feel, I feel like the novel. A lot of my ideas come in as novels because what I love, what's distinct for me about the novel is it's obvious the length, the length of something, and complexity, the the room to really grapple with complexity and go into depth. Um, I'm not. I don't feel like I'm as proficient in poetry. I mean, I'm probably not. I should. I wouldn't call myself a poet, for instance. Although I, I, have, I have a bunch I've written over the, over the years. A few that were even published, but not enough. I feel to to say that confidently. And obviously, I've written short stories, but I find the short story form, I mean, delicious, but very difficult. And and I love your question because recently, now having kids and not having a whole lot of time. I'm working on my fourth novel and struggling, struggling to, to put the time into what you need for a novel is so much headspace and just and time to sink into something. Um, and I was recently given a project to write a series of short stories and I just sort of hit those off. I don't know, I wrote like seven over the course of I thought, oh, that came really easy. And I thought, how can I turn my novel into a series of short stories? Because clearly, so it can also be about time, that one has the time to hold a certain kind of thought, but not the length of time to deal with the, the it's unwieldy. You know, this, for me, something about the novel is this thing that's unwieldy, that you have to, you know, it's not going to fit in a nice little ring box. You, you've got to have a, you know, a big ship container to deal with this thing. It's a bit of a dragon. Um, but I just, but I think I did want to say your, you know, your question also suggests that it's always uh, this definitive decision, like, okay, I'm good. This is going to be a poem. This is good. Sometimes we're wrong and it's always just a hunch. You have an idea and you test it out somewhere. And then I think the humility of, of writing is to be able to say, okay, maybe it belongs differently somewhere else or belongs exactly as it's looking, but in a different form um, and to be able to play and test and check, um, to be able to turn around, to be able to say, okay, I was wrong. My hunch was wrong. Let me look for something else. I do like that response. I do like it a lot because um, to a certain extent, I do think that writing is experimental um, and you just have to go with it. So what would you say is changing and not changing in the ways that people write from Alice Walker to Jane Austen, Achebe, um, and now you, what would you say has remained the same in the novel form and what has changed over time? Huh, wow. Um, 
think about that one. I mean, the the one of the things I, I mean, I think what doesn't change is that regardless of time or culture, regardless of the personality, you know, behind the piece, um, it's always it's always an offering. You know, it's 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 always so 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 these things exist because others con there's there's consumption. Um, Aminata, I um, was Aminata. I'm thinking of two different people. Amata Aidu has this wonderful way she talks about it. How you know if you if something was written, you know, and somehow was in let's say a, a, a waterproof plastic container and sunk to the bottom of the ocean and wasn't experienced by anybody, even the author, for however long, and then suddenly um, emerged somewhere on the shores of somewhere and was able to be read in the language it was written and understood, um, that, that's literature in that, in that moment. It's not so, because when it's just at the bottom of the ocean, she says it's, it's barely just a thing. So I think that kind of exchange, it's such an intimate, ubiquitous, but kind of intimate and so delicate offering, is, it doesn't change. What changes? I mean, times change, technology changes. Um, I'm always curious whether the means, like the, the kind of the, the machinery we have to produce work has any impact on the nature of the work that's produced. So for instance, you know, I have some writer friends who only write by hand. I never thought myself such a person, but because of time, I find myself writing on this thing. I mean, I, I could never have thought I would do that, but because I don't have the time for even the ceremony of coming to sit in front of my laptop, talk less of get a pen and paper, I like five words quickly on my whatever, on the app I have that takes notes. There was a time when I used to write with voice, like I would record it on a voice recorder because the sentences were coming very clearly, but I had nowhere else to put them. So I can say definitively that, that ch that's changing anything, but I think it's, it, it's, it's an interesting study to look at like, okay, the means of production has changed. Does that impact the kind of stories we tell? And then the other thing that I think culture changes, um, mm -hmm. I think the kinds of stories that we're seeing, um, and then because I'm sort of in the film world suddenly with this adaptation work that I'm doing, I think a lot about film. I think a lot about the kinds of characters we're seeing that we just weren't seeing a decade ago. Um, I think of what various political movements have meant for storytelling, um, characterization. I when I watch series, I notice, I, like I know there's, there's the compulsive nature of a series, like they always have to hook you, but there's also, there's also a telling of um, quotidian moments in some series, I'm obviously speaking in general terms, like sort of quotidian gestures or moments between people um, that I think is interesting commentary on what it is to be maybe urban in in this century. Um, so I mean, I think it's easier to spot what stays the same than it is to spot what changes. Um, apart from that, it does feel to me like new, old stories that were ignored or downplayed or you know downright maligned are emerging. And I, it's wonderful to see, quite frankly. We are in an emergent time. Um, are there any literary ancestors that have inspired your writing? And if they are, why have they done so? Wow, yeah, I mean, so many. Um, I mean, I think of, it's almost, I always think of that in terms of like my, the different ages of reading. So if I think of reading the preteen, my preteen readings, a lot of the books that my, and when you're that age, mostly it's books that uh, my parents buy for me or introduce me to. Um, my mom was from the Caribbean and 
my dad did a lot of research in the Caribbean. So I read a lot of uh, Caribbean authors like George Lamming and Z. Edgar and um, um, I also read books by um, people like Rosa Guy, who's an African-American woman, um, uh, a Nigerian author called Sydney Bedford wrote a book, Yoruba Girl Dancing, which had a huge impact on me, um, definitely as a reader, as a young reader. In my teens, I guess I read the, I don't want to say more typical, but I, that was probably the age when I was introduced to Toni Morrison, who remained a writer that um, just, yeah, it's really seminal in, I think forming some of my writerly sensibilities. Um, later in my late teens, um, she's not an ancestor yet, but um, Arundhati Roy is a writer that I have a, a, a great amount of um, respect for and meant a lot to me because she's an architect. And I, I had an unhappy time as an architect. There was a lot going on. Um, and I don't have to tell you, I mean, but in the university and students, particularly student like black students, it was it was not an easy department to be in. And um, I often wanted to um, I wanted to quit and not fulfill on my my degree many times. And also I lost my mom. My mom died in that period when I was studying architecture. And um, Arundhati Roy started having studied architecture and still gone on to write and write so amazingly um, was a source of inspiration. There, there are many writers. Uh, um, I mean, uh, August Wilson, who's a playwright, um, African American playwright. Yeah, just the way he tells stories. And it's funny, I've read his plays. I think I've maybe, and then obviously Fences was made into a movie recently, or a couple of years ago. But I don't think I've ever seen any of his plays performed. But even like when you, to read the play, is so, to read the plays was so remarkable. Um, yeah, so many, so many ancestors and, and living, and living ancestors that exist. Um, thank you so much for that. I, I think it's interesting that every single author mentions Toni Morrison. I have not come across anyone who doesn't. Um, so in the academy, we believe in the total independence of the text. That once the text leaves your hands and enters the public sphere, its meanings become open. Um, so my question to you is, would you rather we dictate, would you, would you rather dictate what we make of your stories? Yeah, no. Is that a trick question? I mean, <laughs> for, forget, forget if I would rather. I mean, I can't. What, what, what planet do I live on? But also, I think that's the point talking about Amata. I just comment about, you know, the thing that goes under, like, it's an offering. So, so, so what's the point, you know, of, of offering without carrying any of the risks of what it is to offer, you know, and those risks are rejection, derision, of course, they can be praise and uh, reward, uh, there could be indifference, there could be anger, there could be resentment, um, there could be sadness, but that's, I mean, it's so funny. I had a conversation just some hours ago with a gentleman who'd read my book in connection with this project I'm doing. And he was telling me what the book's about. And he really told me things I hadn't realized. And I thought, that's the point. That's the point. That's one of the points of this is that I'm not the arbiter of what all this means. I mean, there is an, it is organic, like you said. It is about testing. It is a hunch. The whole book is an experiment. It's, and it's not perfection. And you put that experiment out there and people then tell you things. And part of the, I don't think part of the contract is that I have to agree or even necessarily listen to the feedback, but I mean, in general terms, but I think I do, there are times when that, particularly from trusted sources, that kind of input and feedback has been really powerful for me and for my own writing journey. And I just talk about, trusted sources because you know I get stuff on Facebook where people say oh you know strangers are like you know you just write sad things or why don't you write a happy story so I mean there's some bits of feedback that are it's not interesting for me to engage with but but um I have no issue with 
a bit of um, traction. You know, I, I, I always say, and I think my sister-in-law, who's also a writer, said something similar where, where it was like, if, if something is only praise, then there's probably something wrong. You know, um, I'm on a journey, right? And it's it's not writing has never been about perfection. It's about a, a big and gallant attempt to do something that is impossible to do, actually. Um, and and it's an exercise. And I hope I live long enough to keep doing it as much as I can, um, and have a, a real body of work to show for that. So, I mean, long answer and the short answer. Is is no, no, I don't. <laughs> well, there'd be no point. There'd be absolutely no point. True. Um, I've heard you. I think you've already touched on this, but let's come to um the decolonial elephant in the room, which is the issue of language. So English is no longer the colonizer's language, not least because the colonizer is not here with us anymore, or perhaps not in the same way. But English is still not Sisotu or Tonga or Hausa. So what I'd like to know from you is what are your thoughts on writing and, and language choice? Yeah, I mean, firstly, I, I don't have a choice. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm of a, a generation or a kind of... Uh, person or subject that it had was distanced uh, from my father, I say my father tongue, because my mother was English speaking, she was from the Caribbean, but I mean, that's a whole other story, you know, if you think of the transatlantic slave trade. But um, I didn't, you know, I grew up with a father who chose, while he did speak Yoruba to us, part of the colonial project was the dominance of that of that language in all other spaces. I was always taught in English. You know, Yoruba was a language that we took in school, but taught very badly. And um, despite all my father's attempts, I'm far from fluent and couldn't really write. I mean, I, I speak Yoruba in a very basic way, um, but could never attempt to write in it. And it's it's a wound, you know, I'll be honest. It's not, this isn't, I don't say that smugly. It's a, it's my own wound that I have about not having that. I had a very interesting experience some years ago where I took about three months off and I went back to Ibado in Nigeria, to the University of Ibado, who they give a really amazing course to children like me. So Yoruba is familiar because I grew up with it in my ear, but I, I don't know that I can talk it. And they run a course specifically for that kind of child. It's quite interesting. And I spent, I don't know if it was three months, maybe it was two months, in the program with teachers. Um, it's an amazing school. It's called the Yoruba Language Center at UI. And I must say, that those are some of the happiest days of my life so far, just to be immersed in my language and learning it and realizing I knew it, you know, realizing how familiar it was, all the stuff I knew, but just that I don't speak it enough to feel confident. Um, and I also had to make, it was a chance to make peace, you know, and say, look, I'll, I'll never be fluent in this language. I'll always, I'll always, my words will always come out, you know, stuttery and the pronunciation, it's a tonal language. So that also is a real, you know, it's, that makes it, makes it gorgeous, but it also makes it extra difficult. Um, and, you know, I'll always be haunted by it. I, I wrote a bit about that experience because it was so profound for me. And um, I, I think a, a big part of this conversation about language is also to, you know, know what you can do. And it's a bit like the, the biblical phrase, right? Like know what you can do and know what you can't do and make peace because, because you can't, I can't spend too much time just suffering it. Um, that's uh, and that said, I mean, I try and use a bit of Yoruba. Not that I try deliberately to do it, but I think it comes out a lot in the writing. Um, yes, yes. And I, you know, I hear it, and I think they think you're right. There are things that are can exist in a language that can't be translated, or not with ease, or not completely. Um, 
And the way, the way we remedy that is we, I mean, I would love to be able to write a novel where a couple of pages, I could just go off in Yoruba, you know, and we'll work it out later how people understand. I'm not there yet, but I think that's one of the things we can do is, you know, why do we feel like we have to, you know, sort of relegate languages to certain spaces? Why can't the book be multilingual, you know, and have all of them in there and we'll work it out? I did feel that sense of wound or that sense of um, haunting when I was reading um, Bomb Boy, especially in Oscar's character. Um, so yes, that's a great way. That's a great segue actually to your novels because let's move on to your novels. Would you say that um, you favor any one of them over the other? And if so, why is that? Yeah, you know, the one, the one that's always my favorite is the one that's coming. Because, because I think when it's done, it's a project, it's an exercise, it's part of, I mean, yes, there's a lot of um, celebration <laughs> in the product at the end, but it's the process and the grappling and the, the dark spaces one goes through to get the work out that really register with me. And so like I'm now occupied by another book entirely it doesn't exist for anybody else, you know, um, but me. And that's always the best book. I also think there's a little Freudian thing there in the sense that it's always better in one's head. <laughs> you know, once you realize, like, oh, okay, I got that wrong and I couldn't quite interpret, you know, that character. So there's always this thing of I'll fix it in the next book. I'll be better in the next book. I'll sort that out in the next book. Um, and so, yeah, it's always the next book that's the, the shiny one. Um, I enjoyed an unusual brief by you. Um, I, it's a, it's a, it's the timing of the book, first of all, um, was was something that really resonated with me. But also, I liked how you you explored um, complex grief. You know, grief that is not straightforward, and and also the idea that there's no linear particular way to deal with grief. I really resonated with those ideas. Mm. Um, so. Um, Let's come to Bomb Boy. It is perhaps one of your widely known novels, and actually a number of postgrad students here at the UFS are working on it or, or have worked on it in their research. So what was the initial trigger for you to want to write the story? Um, the, you know, and that this was about a decade ago, if not longer, so I'm also casting my mind back, but. I wanted to write, I think one of the initial thrusts was I wanted to write about um, isolation, like a kind of person. I always come, by the way, to text through character, almost all, like all three books, it was always from character. So like with Bomboy, you know, Leke, and by the way, like in early versions of Bomboy, Leke and Oscar was the same person. I know that sounds a bit weird, but like I hadn't formed the full story in my head when I started writing. And I thought Leke becomes Oscar as an adult. And then I realized, no, 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 no. Um, it's two different people. And with um, the woman next door, it was, um, you know, the, um, the, the, this, this idea of these two women. And with Unusual Grief, it's this idea of this mother with this, this kind of task ahead of her, unbearable task of grieving her child, grieving her estranged child. So with Bomboy, yes, I... Leke, it was this idea of somebody who's so isolated from society on the edge, kind of a pariah, um, and yet so in need of connection. Um, how does he find it? How does he get it? And who is he? So usually that's how I would start thinking about something, or this is the thought, that this is the idea that pops up that I then work on and trouble and trouble and trouble until we have a bit of a story. Um, but that would have been one of the initial, initial thoughts about a, a deeply isolated, strange guy. I mean, very early on, which might be interesting as well. I have a very organic way of working, which is I don't chart out the book and I don't know how it's going to end when I start, which is a nightmare because I lose a lot of my work because I go down a path that is just cannot be fulfilled on. But there were versions of, of, of Bon Boy where Leke was a fully fledged um, serial killer. I did a lot of research into serial killing. 
um in, yeah. in the, there's a i know i know it's bizarre but i i thought like he because and, and he captures somebody so some of those scenes where he's harassing young women um in, in early versions, I mean, it's fun to talk about. He, I wrote scenes where he had somebody, you know, in a hole in his garden, for instance, still alive, but in a hole. Um, and it's so funny. It was a time when we weren't, like now you go onto Netflix and everything, serial killer, serial killer. But the first one was that guy who, who kills bad people, serially, I've gotten his name. And that was just coming out at the time. And I think I couldn't grapple with the ethics of, because I needed him to be a good character ultimately. And I thought I'm delving into something with, it's very dark. I mean, I might do it differently now, but I'm, yeah, I might do it differently now, but I just thought I can't quite go in that direction. Um, so I, 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 I didn't go along the lines that he ever actually captures anybody or attempts to do anything to anybody other than the harassment that he's, he's caught for. Um, I think it's interesting that you should say that because when I was reading, um, I resonated with the character of, of um, Leke because I thought, oh, I understand the loneliness, I understand the routine. But then as I read on, I thought, oh no, am I rooting for a serial killer? And what does that say about me? But then at the end, I realized that no, this is just a guy who has um, a deep wound, a deep psychological wound or a deep yeah. spiritual wound. And if he saws it, out, he should be fine. And I liked what that meant for us who might have resonated with that character. Yeah, I think I think you're right. That was my hunch because it was like how to not pathologize, how to not just you know, like we we are all that, we're fallible. And in particular, Leke's story, he's he's trying to figure himself out this so at this young, vulnerable age, um, with very mangled tools. You know, at the best of time, we have mangled tools, but he in particular, because of his story, is, uh, you know, has really in, insufficient tools to figure to figure things out. So anyway, but it's interesting, you, you actually thought, oh, zero killer alert. <laughs> yeah. So Leke is not a migrant per se, but his father is Nigerian. And the kind of experiences that he goes through are not uncommon with migrants in South Africa. So is Lady a fictional version of lived experiences that you have known or, or you have heard about in South Africa? Yeah, I mean, I, from the perspective of, of being, because it's, it's also about isolation. So from the perspective of feeling isolated and also the dilemma of belonging, where do you belong, where is home? <clears throat> I would say yes. I mean, that's very familiar. And I mean, I can qualify that by saying um, uh, my my parents were were teachers, and 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 um, my mother was a um, was a town planner, and so I was lucky to at least have some level of stability in the home, um, and not at least not not financial precarity. But often there's also that layer of financial precarity, which exacerbates the other layers of isolation, um, loss of a sense of belonging or place, uh, disconnection from culture and people. Um, so, but yes, for sure. I, you know, I wrote sometimes in channeling Leke. You know, I thought of what it was like to. I came here when I was twelve. When, when we came through from Nigeria to Cape Town, my dad was teaching at the University of the Western Cape. And um, we the added thing, of, let's not forget, I forgot that one, race. Because I think for a lot of, at least for me as a Nigerian, that was something I hadn't had to deal with to the degree here. Um, the, 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 wo the, the wounds of that kind of, uh, racialized past, obviously apartheid and longer. Those were not familiar. That those aren't. That's not a familiar emotional landscape. And to be introduced to that, you know, um, at that age, and trying to figure that out. Uh, but I had. I mean, I. I did. I feel like when I came here as a twelve-year-old, I kind of disappeared for a couple of years until I. You know, I couldn't make friends. I couldn't. I was weird. 
Um, I looked weird, I, you know, because I didn't fit in. Um, I sounded weird. Um, my culture was weird. I still have this memory of being in school. So I went to a, I, I was, I was, I was kind of advanced in Nigeria, but I had to redo a year when we came here because of, I don't know, maybe they didn't trust the records or something. So I went back to a class and I redid what they called at the time standard five, which I guess is grade seven. Anyway, I remember, stand, I remember sitting in class and the teacher addressing me. And I remember standing to respond, which is what I've been taught from my school schooling in Nigeria. And I remember everyone, including the teacher, staring oh, okay. at me like I was an alien. And, I, and, and that's what those years were like, just yeah. not understanding and not being able to piece it together for a while, for several years, I would say. So yes, I drew on that, the energy of that for, for some of Leke's sense of displacement. So still on Leke, Bomboy and South Africa. How much of what South Africa has given and taken from you inspired um, any aspect of the novel? And do you think the same story would have come to you in the manner that it did had you lived anywhere else? Yeah, no, I mean, I would say how much everything and with the same story, no, I think, I think that I mean, I think, and, and I mean, these questions are nice because they're poetic questions like this about like trying to think of the, of the parallel universes, right? But they're, they're also deceptive because I think it's like you can't see your own eyeballs. How, like the, 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 the exercise of trying to answer the question is, is really difficult because you, you just can't, you can't look at your own eyeballs. So, but my hunch is that I couldn't have written it anywhere else. I, I couldn't have written it without the experiences I had and that I strung together to write it. Um, and in fact, all my novels have, dis have displacement somewhere. You know, um, that's a feature that is just, it's almost locked in now. I'd love to get free of it, but I, I don't seem to be able to. I think other writers have a do. I have not been able to do so yet. And that's, you know, that's my kind of writerly journey to be on. But the DNA for me is very much connected to like the experiences I've had and, and where I'm writing from. Um, because, because the writing is so organic and so kind of coming from what I dream. You know, it's, it's not, um, I don't, I, I'm not able, I should say, to write in a much more mechanical way. And I think sometimes I wish I were because I think I could be more efficient and also I could write sexier stuff that's maybe slightly more popular. But um, what I end up writing is, is very enmeshed with, with who I am. And I think, I think a lot of the characters are a couple of steps away from being quite biographical. Um, so, so, yeah. Um. So now to, to the novel, The Woman Next Door. The metaphor of the hedge, one may argue, is entangled with the South African history and the regimentation of human interaction on the basis of race. What aspect of this novel would you say South Africa and the world need the most? What, what aspects? Sorry, and I didn't hear the, the metaphor of the what you said? The metaphor of the hedge. The head. Yes. Yeah. And what and and the la the last part of your question, what what aspects of this novel would you say that South Africa and the world in general need the most or need to take um, away from it? Okay. Yeah. I mean the, the two things, I mean, I remember somebody saying to me about the woman next door. She didn't, she'd found there was an interaction between Hortensia and Marion where <clears throat> Marion is sort of tinkering with Tensha's hair. Um, and I mean, I think race is important. So it was a, a white person saying to me, uh, I was just saying she didn't find it believable. Uh, and I think one other person, an African-American man also told me that once, she didn't find something believable. And 
I, you know, for me, I, I think that's something to learn because I think if we go looking in our, in our novels and stories for believability, um, we're in trouble. And I actually think that my task or the task I definitely charge myself with or I'm charged with in writing is to imagine, you know, what seems impossible because we're in such trouble. So what are the things that are believable and possible? Um, the destruction of the earth, more wars, more degradation, more rape, more theft, more poverty, more inequality. So who, who then is tasked with imagining us out of some of those things? Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always open to critique, but I mean, I'm really, I find it a lot more interesting when people say, um, you know, the characters seem so improbable and yet I relate to them. You know, that situation feels like so bizarre and yet I'm in it with you in that scene. I mean, that's more interesting to me. Um, and what I think is more interesting for us in the world is how to lead us into things that feel pretty improbable at the moment, but what are the ways we can find ourselves there? And can we, can we think of those ways? Um, and actually for me, that triggers um, another question, which is what is your idea of sisterhood? Because when I was reading your book, I, I felt that, that um, in, in, in some way or another, there was this idea of sisterhood across characters, which was so different, whether because of race or class or whatever. Um, and you just never think they'd form a friendship, but then they do, and they realize that you know they're not all that different. So, what is your idea of of um, of sisterhood? Yeah, and I, I, and I want to temper that by saying I also think it's important to say I don't I don't necessarily think those two women go off and become the tightest of besties. You know, I like I always talk about their relationship as a as a hateship. You know, I don't, I don't, I hope that I, it's not like one leaves it with your heart sort of swollen to Disney proportions. I, I hope that what I'm saying is they're going to figure it out and they're going, they're, it's, there'll be some caustic moments and there'll be some passive aggressive moments and they'll stumble and fall and mess up and not speak for a year and then find a way to speak again, which feels more realistic to me. Um, they're not going to just lick pinkies and walk off into the sunset. Um, so that's one thing about, about that relationship. It's not as if it ends absolutely positively, hundred percent fact, perfect. Um, but in terms of your question, what's my, did you say definition or oh, idea or oh, idea of sisterhood? Ooh, wow. Um, I think. I think something that that is that has I, the, the one word that keeps coming up for me is um, I want to say flexible. It sounds like such a sort of a businessy term, but like something that can hold, I guess, a, a holding space, a, a, a something that can can work with the waters of what of what of 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 of, of that, that we swim in as um as sisters as you say or as women um because it's complex and it's changing and it's dynamic so if i think just personally of the, the women that i think of as sisters they they can hold and there isn't a whole lot of expectation or a sense of what it has to look like because at different times of life and different moments, it needs to look differently. Um, I think we get into trouble when we have a, a picture of the expectations, like this picture that it must look this way. If it doesn't look that way, then it's not. Um, so generosity, maybe is the word I'm looking for, not flexibility, but something generous, um, generosity of spirit, to, and, the, and the possibility of being gotten, like when somebody gets you. That's always precious. All right. So, an unusual grief is your latest published um, novel that was published in 2021. 
could you tell us more about what the novel is about and how you were attracted to the theme of, of, of grief? Yeah, I mean, so how I came to an unusual grief, as I mentioned earlier, my mom died when I was about 23, which is um, the age of the, the child who, who dies in the book. Um, without a doubt, the death of my mom, you know, maybe barring the, the birth of my children, is one of the most impact, the profound and impactful experiences of my life. Um, and death and motherhood deeply imprinted on me, you know, from that formative age, at least that early adult age. Um, I've always wanted to write about motherhood and death. And in many ways, I think it's contained in the books before. But this was the book where I wanted to really get into it. I didn't want to write it too because so much is biographical, I felt it's just too much to write about the death of a mother. I wanted to kind of free the project up because it's a fictional project. So I thought, well, what if I died and my mother lived? And let me write about that. And that was that kind of uh, conceit that I gave myself at the start of the process <clears throat> is what got me into developing this story about Mujisola and Yinka. Um, Mujisola as a woman who didn't think she could have children and didn't really want them, had her child and suffered immensely from postnatal depression. And that set in place a, a, a really difficult dynamic between mom and child. So that by the time Yinka takes her life, early 20s, they are like strangers to each other. And Moji feels like her job in grief is to know her daughter. Uh, because she never knew her. Part of the story also we go back into Mujisola's experience as, as a daughter and the dynamic between her and her mother, which was also uh, had its own pathologies and of course had an impact on how she went on to mother. So yeah, that's the, I mean, the bit that's maybe missing. So part of why it's unusual grief is the story is really about how Mujisola's grief takes on quite a sensual and sexual turn because uh, Yinka had explored, uh, and I don't know if this is a spoiler, but anyway, we can keep it amongst ourselves, but had explored fetish life and her mother discovers this and, and gets into the kink scene and yeah, goes. I was gasping at that point. <laughs> um, and then lastly, your novels have been long listed and shortlisted for the prizes in literature. What's your take on literary awards and what exactly in your view is being awarded? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I always say, I mean, firstly, I'm, I'm grateful for whatever attention the book gets, whether it's a tweet or a, an award or a this or that. I mean, that's why, because I write the book to be written and those are those are that's evidence that it's being sorry I, I write the book to be read and that's evidence that it's being read and experienced um prizes i mean i i really believe prizes are political and they're political because people are involved so prizes are subjective and they're political they um and and it's important to remember that um Prizes are important. They form a really important part, I think, of the literary landscape because it's tough. It takes a lot to write. It takes a lot of time and effort. And the landscape of prizes and that kind of recognition and obviously some of the prizes that have money attached to them bring a necessary reward and attention to authors and to publishing houses uh, that sometimes are not you know, big, shiny authors or big, shiny publishing houses, but are really you know, authors just doing good work quietly somewhere and the same with the publishing house. So I think they're a good and necessary part of the landscape, but I, I think it's, you have to also remember that they're political and I don't think prizes are the arbiter of, of like talent and genius. I mean, I think so many things, it, the nature of the world we live in and content, you know, and the like, how much can be written and is written, it's very hard. It's very easy rather for, for things that are brilliant to disappear. Mm -hmm. I also think sometimes things that are brilliant might not be popular. And then later they're popular because of like a zeitgeist that comes up. So 
it's not it's not absolute the price for sure i i don't so my regard of prizes is that they're nice the few times i've been whatever listed or awarded it's been wonderful i'm deeply grateful um it feels good and it feels like really good feedback to have worked really hard on something and somebody a group of people usually strangers can recognize that um but um, I think the important thing with writers is you have to be, you know, you can't write for the prize. <laughs> like you, you have to be able to, that has to be extra. That can't be why you're doing what you're doing because uh, firstly, I think it's a misguided form of, um, of, 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 of um, um, what, like um, assessment. Like if you think I'm going to write and I'll have done a great job if I get a prize, you, you have to find a different form of assessment, I think. Um, I, 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 I'll say it here. I mean, I think many, many books that I personally find mediocre or not so good win prizes too. I don't say that to throw shade on anybody, but just to say, including maybe mine, maybe sometimes I've been awarded something and somebody had to thought, oh, okay, well, I didn't really think, you know, and, and we have to remember this is a subjective feel that we're in if we're in the world of creating you know what i really respect i don't think i could do it but i mean those people that turn down nobel prize prizes for <laughs> literature and turn down booker prizes <laughs> you got some you know you you got you got something um consider, yeah it, it's a i mean i think often they were people that maybe clearly didn't need the money but also had a had had a regard and I, I respect that i really respect that because i think i think it's true that that you can you really say definitively this is the best in in the realm we're in um i actually think i to be at last i'll stop after this but i think i love the short listing or even the long listing because you you get a cohort and that feels much more accurate I think that we, that's much easier to do, to get a cohort of works over a period of time, sorry, over a specific period of time, maybe even uh, on a particular theme, and say these are really works of merit and should be regarded. I mean, I think that feels a lot more like um, I, I relate, so I love being part of a short list or a long list, and it's very uncomfortable actually to win stuff. I haven't won that much, uh, so not something I have to worry about. But um, this sort of this sort of um, addiction we have to the best, the best, which which is easier to do, I think, if you're a swimmer or you you know I don't know you run marathons, but harder to do, I would say, in in something like this. Thank you so much. Um, I have come to the end of my questions that I have for you today. Thank you so much um, for engaging us. I will now open up the floor to the audience. I'm sure they are quite burning with questions. So I already see a hand from Marita. So um, yes, you may go ahead, Marita. Thank you so much. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I have to run, I have another appointment, but I just wanted to share something with you. I was so excited when I saw you were coming to talk to us because I have prescribed an unusual grief for my third year seminar next year. It's oh, a wow. seminar on the art of dying, representations of death and dying in contemporary literature. And I found the novel so profound, especially in terms of the ways in which Mojisola navigates grief's trajectories into these intimate spaces of loss and sorrow and Morrison's re-memory in order to rediscover who Yinka was after she died. Because I think in the, in the suicide literature that we deal with, there's a recurring theme. Usually suicides are committed by people who are somewhat estranged from their backgrounds. And then the question is, how on earth do the loved ones of daughters and sons and fathers and mothers and love and friends get to know them after they have died and i also what i love about this novel is also the <coughs> that this journey to self-discovery also teaches her so much about herself because she then has to carve a place for herself in beyond the labels of wife and mother 
So mm. I am so excited to share your writing with my students next year. And I Thank want you. to ask, please, if you would at all be willing, perhaps, but I let you know far in advance to come and talk to us, perhaps, would that be okay? Yeah, that's that's. Uh, firstly, thank you so much. That's uh, such a wonderful words, and I'm really touched uh, by what you say. And that the book is prescribed. That's amazing. I would be honored to connect with you and your your class. I mean, obviously, yeah, it's a year. It's a year, but yeah, let's let's keep. You know, you can get my details. I think from I Oliver, will. perhaps, and yeah. Thank you so, much. so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for that, Marissa. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? I am trying to see if the student who's currently working on your book is also here in the session. But are there any other questions from the floor? Let me see. I see a hand, NM. Yes. You may go ahead. I didn't see whose hand it was, but um, they may go ahead and speak. It said NM, but the, the hand is also down. Maybe it was like a... It was Nonki. Oh. Okay, Nonki, you may go ahead. Okay, I'm not sure if Nonki can hear us or if he's having connection issues. But in the meantime, we can take um, someone else's question. In, in, I just have the, the letters now. There is a hand up. Nolutando Nkosi. Yes, you may go ahead, Nolutando. Um, good day, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the insightful talk we have had for today, planned for today. Well, my questions all are divided into two. The first one being based on Boom Boy. Uh, the book Boom Boy focuses on issues such as belonging and transculturalism through the character of Leke, the protagonist. My question then is, do these aspects or themes reminisce your life or how or the significant they, they hold? I'm not sure if I should proceed to the next one or give Pro time to- Proceed to the next one and then I, okay. I can, yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the second one being amongst themes you have written under, for example, belonging and identity for the novel Boom Boy, motherhood and loss for the novel Unusual Grief, and also racism for the woman next door. How challenging or fulfilling or delicate is to choose the specific issues for the books and the type of characters to use who are both different or indifferent to you? Thanks for the questions. I, I might be able to sort of answer them together, which is why I said, uh, I like, sort of, maybe it's almost the same answer. Uh, I mean, definitely in terms of Bomboy Boy and the, 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 the belonging that you talk about and um, the, ter the terms you mentioned, I mean, I'm not an academic, so please excuse me if I don't have the, the, the lingo, um, but it is, it is very much connected to my own experiences. Uh, at least it starts from there. Um, and it's an it's an exploration of character. So, so in terms of the second question, I I, I, I seldom come to text from theme. Of course, there are themes in the stories, but I don't approach. I don't sort of think I really want to write about grief. Um, I often think I want to write. I often sort of hear a person. Like with Leke, I saw I saw Leke. Like I saw this. And that's why I said it was initially it was um, initially he, him and Oscar were the same person because I, I you know I saw this sort of man that was so um, 
set apart, so isolated and disconnected. And, and how did he get to be that way? And what was his youth like? And then began this exploration. So the themes come afterwards. And that feels important to me because the, 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 the engine of the work is in character, is in building character. Um, and so, and with, with the woman next door, I wanted to write about a person who, um, who's, I, I knew I wanted her to be really old or like sort of at the end of her life, more life behind her than in front. And, and, and also like quite a life behind her, like not a, not a soft life, not a lot of love, um, at least not a lot of sort of joyous love, um, not a lot of joy, maybe I should say. Like a very hardened woman, a woman, um, and then asking how did she get to be that way, and also asking myself, and is it too late? Is it ever too late to find some softness, to find some connection? Um, in some ways, it's the same in all the novels. This this dilemma of a character who has suffered, and it's it's a, can we heal? I think healing is a is a big thing that shows up in all the in all the books, um, how do we repair is something I asked as well. And I guess with the book like The Woman Next Door, how do we repair as a nation? Can we? Is it the TRC? Is it many TRCs? Or that's not the root. Um, how do we repair hate? How do we repair from prejudice? Um, is it a lifelong sentence? Or can we come out of that prison? Um. I do hope that no tando is answered. Prof Nyambi, I see that your hand is up, but I am going to go to to Nonki and say, Nonki, if you want to, if you sorted out perhaps the problems that you are having and you want to speak, you may go ahead before I give the platform to Prof. Are you online? Sorry, lost you there for a few seconds. Um, no, I was just saying, I was talking to Noinki, and but it seems that they are unable to speak still. So I'll go to Prof Nyambi. Prof Nyambi, I see that your hand is up. You may go ahead. Yes, thanks, uh, Tina. I, I hope I'm uh, audible. My network is very poor. Yes, thanks, Tina and uh, Yawande for your fascinating responses so far. Um, I, I don't know if this is... Um, obvious to you as a writer as it is um, obvious to me as a teacher of literature. But it seems to me that um, people are, are losing um, interest in the literal text. Uh, people are reading less and less um, stories in literary form. I, I see this with our students. Um, they really try to learn literature without reading literature. Well, some of them, not most of them. <laughs> and um, I, I also see this at the malls. Uh, you go to the bookshop and you you are in there five, ten minutes, you are the only one. I, I really hope that people are buying books online, but <laughs> um, I wonder if this is something that is... Um, that you worry about, that uh, people are losing interest in the literary story and perhaps shifting more and more to the cinematic story. And I see yourself, you are also working <laughs> in uh, film, uh, so to speak, as I heard you say, but I really hope that we are not losing you in, uh, in the literary world. Yeah. Uh, is that something that worries you? Thanks, thanks for that question. Thanks so much. I mean, um, so firstly, no, you're not losing me because, because there are things that one can do in literature that you can't do on film and vice versa. Things you can do in film that you can't do in literature. So it is a form of storytelling. It's something we've sort of been collecting that's here to stay and we'll always feel like we're on the edge of the death of the book. 
you know, because the book has been dying for a while, right? There was a time when there were no bookshops and, uh, you know, when Amazon came and all the bookshops had to close. And then there was suddenly a time when the bookshops could open again and thrive. And so maybe we sort of realized that, okay, we'll always have the book. We'll always have it with us. Um, um, and that we'll also always have that anxiety because of its preciousness. We'll always also have that anxiety of the loss of the book. I think your your obviously your observations are spot on um, about reading. And I as you were talking, I remembered an anecdote that Bell Hooks shared about how she realized that her students weren't reading and they were watching. So she then started watching what they were watching and using what they were watching to teach what they ought to be reading. You know, and that's really what got her because she then became you know she wrote so much commentary on film and on. Um, on popular culture stuff. And I think she she felt as a teacher, she needed to in order to engage with these students that were losing something that she thought, you know, would, was just, you know, would would always be there, um, which is a reading student, you know, it's, and I can I can understand the worry there that students aren't reading. Um, and what what I what I was also thinking though is part of I mean, part of understanding why that reading isn't happening, I think is important. Um, and part of it is the frenetic, I mean, the, the same way to write a novel, to read a novel. You need to, you need to, I have friends telling me, you know, I haven't been able to read. Just, just the headspace to allow yourself to sink for a decent amount of time to, 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 to gain understanding. Right, because there's no point in reading a sentence. You can't read 40 characters and then go on with the book. Like you have to. So the frenetic nature of, of life and that the young people today are growing up in, and that just gets worse and worse. So what does that do for a reading mind? Um, in other words, are people also just unable to settle the mind? And I know when my kids were young, I, mean, I didn't read for a long time. I just couldn't read. I mean, that's also a different story with, with being a mom or being a parent with young children. Um, but so, so, I mean, I think you touch on something important, but I think there are different angles to come at with that um, other than the, the understandable angle of despair and, and anxiety. Um, I don't lose too much sleep over it because I think, I think it's about storytelling. So my the, the what i worry about is is when people spend hours of time watching what i think is devoid of intelligence you know and i i don't have high standards there but then i think what are you doing you're just you're just watching light really da, da, Um, uh, I'm not sure. I lost yeah. you under at some point, so I did not hear the end of the response. But Prof Yambi, are you answered? Because we did lose you at certain points, but I do think that we got the gist of your answer. Um, I see a hand from Peter, and looking at the time, that should be our final hand. Yes, you may go ahead, Peter. Um, yes, Tina, and thank Tiwanda for this beautiful conversation. Um, my question is actually uh, related to what Prof. Nandu was asking or mentioned about the decline in the readership. And I heard earlier on you mentioned that you are working on a project where you are adapting a novel from a novel to a, a film. Right. So my question is, why an interest uh, uh, in that adaptation, like moving from novels to film, and does that uh, or will that allow you to communicate these things, like the, the way that you do in the novels, in your novels, and how does that impact on your writerly objective? 
Thanks for the question. I mean, I think the same way, like Tina was asking about poetry or, um, or the short story. I mean, film is another form of storytelling. Dance, I mean, I love dance. I don't think I'll ever get to choreograph anything, but uh, you know, the, the, the kernel of, of all of this is creativity and storytelling, and then there are different forms. So, I mean, film, the form of film is, is very captivating as a form. I mean, firstly, the popularity of that, of course, and the accessibility of it, um, but this idea of pictures, um, in, in you write a novel, you use words and you let the reader or the person who's consuming the novel make up their own pictures. When you, when you do the film, you, you put all those pictures, you string the pictures together. Um, and that, that, that sort of spin for me is, is quite a mystery and a puzzle. And I'm excited about learning how to do that well. I love film, I love, I love theater, film, dance. I love all these forms of, 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 of creativity. Um, and so to be able to, to play a bit in the film space. And I've written, I have written for the odd series and so on and found it amazing, very hard, but amazing. I was, I was part of a writer's room for a series. Um, I've never written, like it's, it's, um, it's writing in group form, you know, writing with others. I, I thought this is incredible. I just write by myself, you know, for five years and nobody knows a thing. And in this way, I sit in a room and we throw ideas out. Um, I love that. So I'm partly doing it because just me personally likes it and I'm, I'm intrigued by it and I feel challenged by it in a really good way. And I think it will make me a better writer as well in general, and write better novels. <clears throat> um, but I also think you touch on something which is interesting, which is there's a lot of adaptation. I mean, if you think of some of the, just think of Hollywood, think of like the places where the, the stories that, that, that dominate, right? And, and there, a lot of them are adaptations. Um, what does that mean? It means that, you know, this, this is still where people come to for, for the good stuff. And then finding a way to adapt it um, that makes it exciting and accessible, I think is a powerful task. Um, so, you know, all isn't lost. Um, in the adaptation course, they were giving us all these statistics, including that all the, films that win awards, I don't know, at, at Academy and so on, 90% of them are adaptations. Many producers in production houses, um, they want books. They want to adapt books. They don't want, because they know that the author has, particularly good books have been well, the characters are well wrought. They're really well formed. And that's what makes compelling cinema. That's what makes compelling viewing. So I think it's interesting and we'll find many more connections between literature and cinema um, and there and ways to integrate that maybe even in our learning so that it doesn't feel like we, we've lost um, or we're losing. Um, I hope that answers your question, Peter. So we have run out of time, so I will not be taking any more questions. Um, but thank you so much for being with us today. And it was an absolute pleasure having you and talking to you. And I think you can tell even in the chat box, everyone was very excited to have you here. And it's been just amazing. So thank you so much. And I hope that you thank can you. join us again at some point. Yes, I'd love to. It's amazing. Also, you know, I didn't know there was this much engagement with, with my text. I mean, I think you don't always know who's reading and who's not reading. So it's really wonderful to just thank you, you know, to the teachers and to the students who are engaging with those texts. That's really meaningful to me. Um, I appreciate it. Don't take it for granted. So, yeah, and it's wonderful to have been invited here. Thank you, Prof, for inviting me. And thank you, Tina, for just yeah, being a great interlocutor. Thank you so much. And thank you.